Hello students, welcome back from Module 6. This is dealing with Chapter 5 from the Adams and Lawrence textbook. And uh, we're going to be talking about how to describe your sample. Uh, chapters 4 and 5 are about d doing a descriptive analysis. Chapter 4 was about doing the descriptive analysis. And Chapter 5 is about describing that sample. Um, it's essential that, um, just one touch, real quick touch on ethical issues. Um, it's essential that you maintain the confidentiality of your participants. So when they talk about describing your sample, you can't provide too many details, otherwise somebody can identify who your population is. And if your population is small enough, you can, you can do harm to an entire population as much as you can to an individual. So you have to be careful about describing your population, especially if you're um, getting into um, studying health-related issues when you could violate HIPAA regulations. Um, so use ID numbers, not names. Uh, that way nobody, even while you're writing up or doing your research, in the middle of doing your research, you're not talking about um, John Smith, you're talking about participant number 27. Um, keep forms with identifying information separate from participant responses and report data in aggregate when possible. All of this is going to be very much a part of what you do at the university if you're involved in doing research at the university level because the Institutional Review Board, IRB, will make sure that um, uh, identities are protected. A qualitative analysis allows the reacher, researcher to sort and summarize data from qualitative measures. Um, qualitative, once again, is, um, is, is the more difficult research to do, but for social sciences, um, often considered um, uh, deeply important because you can get into um, finding out the reasons behind behavior rather than just measuring behavior. Um, so, for my research, the one of the uh, for my dissertation. My dissertation is built in almost entirely from an analytic induction, uh, which means I put together one hypothesis based on my participant observation that I did in one location. So my two-year participant observation research was done in Liberty City, um, and specifically MLK Boulevards. That's where I started. Um, I started analyzing uh, 15 MLK Boulevard neighborhoods in the Tri-County area of South Florida, but I focused, ended up focusing entirely on um, Liberty City. Um, I did quite a bit of research in Pompano Beach, but what I, what you can do with analytic induction when you've done one really in-depth research project is you can make a hypothesis from that research, and then that's an analytic, then through an analytic induction process, you hypothesize that that's also going to be the case on the other 14 MLK boulevards in South Florida, and then you go and do another research and revise that hypothesis if you have to so that it fits both of your study populations. And by the time I go through all 15 MLK Boulevard neighborhoods in South Florida, I will have had to revise my hypothesis, potentially will have had to revise my hypothesis 15 times. But by the time I do the 15th study, I've got one hypothesis that now has been adapted so that it applies to all 15 neighborhoods. Um, and that way, and through that an analytic induction process, um, my research continues to improve the, our understanding of what an MLK Boulevard um, circumstance would be in South Florida. So the thematic analysis, thematic analysis is just identifying themes, and the, the card sort method, it talks about that in the textbook. And a priori analysis is you using predetermined categories to evaluate a behavior or response. So you already know where you're going to sort things through how you're going to sort things in your qualitative study based on something that you determined before you went out to do the study. So that's a priori. Before you started the study, you had those categories already done. Um, descriptive statistics, um, that, that's what this chapter is really about. Uh, it's used to summarize the characteristics of your sample. Um, it does a frequency, which is a count. It does a percentage, a uh, percentage of a score within a sample, and a cumulative percentage, which is going to be important for um, assignment number five and also possibly into the um, midterm exam. Um, cumulative percentages are, are very important and I'm going to show you why at the end of this video. Uh, descriptive statistics have a measure of central tendency component. The, the, uh, the measure of central tendency is very important. There's three ways to describe central tendency. The mode, median, and mean. We're going to talk about that at the end of this section as well. Um, and measures of variability, the observed minimum, the observed maximum, these are, these are, anal these are methods of analysis that you, you can use very to, to great advantage when you, um, when you have an open scale 
especially in scale data. When you have an open scale and your data has an observed minimum and an observed maximum, then you know that your population is going to start aggregating um, in the middle. So then you have the range and then you had a standard deviation within that range. And so these are all very important parts about understanding your descriptive statistics once you get them, um, once, you, once they are returned back to you as data. Um, nominal, we talked about this earlier, um, but it's very important now to understand which descriptive statistics fit which variable. So in nominal data, you can only use frequencies and or percentages and you can discover the mode. Um, in ordinal data, then you can get into the median, and so the median becomes a meaningful measure when you have ordinal data. Frequencies and percentages remain, as well as observed minimums, minimum and maximum. Interval and ratio variables that are normally distributed um, can have mean and standard deviation added in to their descriptive statistics, and interval and ratio data um, that are not normally distributed, um, you can have a median analysis of that in an observed minimum, a maximum, or range. But the standard deviation isn't meaningful when there, are, when there is not a normal deviation, a normal distribution. I mean. um, it's important to understand what a normal distribution is. It's a bell-shaped curve. It's symmetrical on both sides. And most scores are centered around the middle and they taper off at either end. So you have the tails. This is a normal distribution. That's what you will hope for. Um, standard deviation works on a normal distribution because when there is a standard deviation you know that everything is going to be distributed um, between one standard deviation above the mean and one standard deviation below the mean. And so that will capture 68.3% of all data. And then if you go to two standard deviations and three standard deviations, these are known distributions. These are known, you, you, it, it is a known fact that if it's a normal distribution, you will capture all of the data within these standard deviation um, measures. Um, a bar graph is a way of graphing. Um, this is what you can do for ordinal data and nominal data. Histograms are going to be important for assignment number five. We're going to have you do your own histogram um, and with a normal curve. And so this is something that you're going to have to understand and I'm going to get into that at the end of the chapter here. Uh, frequency polygon, just a dotted line graph. Um, the um, useful for certain data, we're not going to study that too much here. And here's a good word for you to learn, kurtosis. Um, next time you're at a cocktail party and you want to impress people, talk about a, kurt a kurtosis and keep them all guessing as to what it means. It's such a fun little word, especially when you get into the mesokurtic and the leptokurtic and the platykurtic. Um, which means moderate, high, and flat peaks. Um, uniform distribution, that makes you sound like a nerd, and I like sounding like a nerd, so it's part of my shtick. Um, uniform distribution, all scores have the same frequency, which means if it's in a bar graph, everything in the bar graph yeah, or a histogram is going to be at the same level. Everybody, all the distributions are equal all the way across. So it's a flat bar graph all the way across. Um, bimodal distribution, two distinct peaks. So if you have two bumps, um, or even if you have one small bump and one big bump, you've still got a bimodal distribution. It's not going to fit the normal curve and you can't use certain types of analysis when there's a bimodal distribution. A skewed distribution, uh, these are very fun. When you have a negative skew, what it means is that there is a lot of the information is at the top. A lot of the population is at the top, but that top is far out from where some people are or some um, uh, members of the population are down here at the bottom. So it's skewed to the top because of the population being out there, but not necessarily because there's so many over there. It's because the amount here are very extreme amounts and extremely de and, and they deviate to an extreme degree from, the, um, uh, from where the bulk of the population is. And the positive skew is, means the same thing on the other end. Positive skew is what you see in home prices and people's income. There are some incredibly expensive homes and some incredibly rich people with high incomes, whereas the bulk of them are down here where the curve peaks. But the skew happens because of how many are up at the extreme top. So we see a positive skew a lot when you're talking about incomes and wealth. And you see a negative skew a lot when you're talking about poor health outcomes in third world countries. Okay, this is a SPSS output. Um, SPSS software is what we're going to be using in this um, in, in assignment number five. 
And this is what the text provided for um, uh, for their output of, an, of a sample from SPSS software. Uh, we're going to look at our own SPSS software output at the end of the lecture here and I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction as to what you're going to deal with in assignment number five just so that you know to come back to figure 5.6 when you want to get some help from the textbook on what you're going to do for assignment number five. Um, it talks about the mean, the median, uh, the standard deviation, the skewness, um, standard error of skewness, the range, the minimum, the maximum. Um, all of these things are available on SPSS software and you can get that based on huge data sets which is very very useful. Um, and here's the histogram of course which is what we're also going to look at as well. Comparing interval ratio scores with z-scores. Um, if we have the mean and standard deviation of a normal distribution of interval or ratio scores, we can determine how many standard deviations a score falls above or below the mean. Standard deviations are very important because it determines how close this is to a normal population. And if it doesn't fall into a normal population um, based on these z-scores, then you can't use a lot of the analysis that we normally would use um, when we're looking at that data. Um, and z-scores um, help you express that. Uh, in terms of standard deviations from the mean. Now a z-score tells you how many standard deviations. So what we want to look at in this chart here is the z-score line and these are whole number standard deviations. Now a z-score is never a whole number but if it's a negative z-score you know it's coming towards the tail at the left side and if it's a positive z-score you know it's going towards the tail at the top side. And the z-score te tells you how um, the, the standard how, what the standard deviation is from the mean. And, uh, and how normal the curve is. Uh, percentiles also tell you um, where you're accumulating from. So it starts at zero, goes to 50%, which would be the median, median of the population means 50% of the population is below that point. And, um, and then the cumulative population continues to go out to the top. And these are important numbers to know because especially if you're looking at one-tailed data or two-tailed data. This is the SPSS output which you're going to have to produce for assignment number five. I tell you how to get this SPSS output um, by walking you through the use of the software and then you have to produce a histogram of your own and analyze it based on what you choose from the GSS.SAV data set. And so I've chosen here an ordinal uh, representation of income. Um, ordinal meaning that we have 23 uh, we, instead of allowing the income of uh, annual, reported annual income to be open-ended, which would end up with a very tall skew on the um, histogram by having the people that earn half a million dollars way off to the end, but still having to be on the chart, it would have produced a positive skew. By having ordinal data where everybody who is above a certain income level is in one ordinal quantile, um, what that does is it captures everybody who's off the end of the chart in this last segment. And so you can use ordinal data in a histogram very, very effectively and almost end up with a normal curve. So you can see the nominal, the, the, the normal curve overlaid on top of this data set. And, and the histogram does not fall into a normal uh, distribution. Um, so that's why that overlay is there. And so that, that this chart here and this SPSS output allows us to analyze a lot of, uh, 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 analyze the reported annual income of individuals who participated. It tells us how many are in the data set. 993 is the N number. So this is a large N survey. Um, it tells us the mean and the median. The mean is reported here, which is 14.21. Now remember, this is income. But 14.21, what does 14.21 mean in income? 14.21 as a mean for income means that it's in the mean is in the 14th quantile, and that's all it means. Now you have to look at the 14th quantile based on this chart here to determine which income group is in the 14th quantile. And in this case here, if you could see it in high focus, you would see that the 14th quantile is between $22,524,999. So the median income here is under $25,000, but above $22,500. Now, this is how to, um, and, and this is what you need to do, this is a very complicated chart here, and I'll, I'll make a slide available of this for your, um, uh, for when you do assignment number five, but what it does is it tells you that this 14th quantile um, is down here, based on the red arrow, the 14th category is down here, as far in the histogram, it's down here, 
in the reported chart, and it's the mean reported here. Um, the median, of course, which you see in blue here, is the second number down in this chart here. So because there's 993 um, individuals who took part in the survey, the median is the 496th person. So at, you would count upward in this histogram to the 496th individual, and everybody below that is 50% of that population. And so the median comes up a little bit above the 14th quantile because it's negatively skewed here, and we've got a grouping of this population on the higher end. So the mean comes first, the median comes next, and the mode comes last, which is represented in black. And so the mode is this highest count here. And then the last thing I want you to understand is based on the green here, the quantiles are not evenly spaced. So when you look at this histogram, you can't think of these as, oh, okay, we are wearing $2,500 groupings of income. So this, the, each, each quantile does not go up by $2,500 evenly. At the bottom, portion, it goes up by $2,500 increments. Actually, it starts at $1,000 increments, then it goes up to $2,500 increments, and then it goes to $5,000 increments. And by the time you're at this top end category, you're going up by $15,000 increments. But what they've done is they've captured these quantiles in a way for the GSS based on their experience. They've, they've, they've understood that when they look at income, they want to look at income more in a more granular detail at the low end of income levels. And by the time they get up to the top end of incomes, they can group $15,000 increments into these quantiles because their behavior is, 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 is more um, standardized in the high income level than it is at the low income level. So they go up by $1,000 increments, $2,500 increments, so that they can look at the differential levels of poverty. And this is, what they, this is how they've done these quantiles, so that they can look at the entire population in 23 quantiles rather than having this open-ended scale data. But once again, it still has a meaningful zero um, because they are, their income, it is income after all that we're working with, but the quantiles make it uh, more easily analyzed when you break it down into research. Now, a cross tabulation is the other thing where they're going to be looking at as far as SPSS output. This is the SPSS output of a, of a, uh, a cross tabulation, and this is going to be explained in more detail. But here it talks about, here's where the cumulative percentage comes in. So when you're looking at a cross tabulation, it, it shows you individual percentages in the columns and in the rows, and you can pick which way you go with the SPSS software as to where the cumulative percentage works. And you'll learn in assignment number five how to take advantage of whether you want that to be represented in the rows or the columns, and there's very distinct advantages to doing that in a cross tabulation. So what we've done is, in this cross tabulation, which I give you for assignment number five, we look at how the the educational degree, which somebody has, they have less than high school, high school, or junior college or more. And then we compared that to whether they, and how much they use the computer, and whether or not they use a computer. And so we can look at this cross tabulation of six cells based on percentages, which are provided in every cell, and cumulative percentages, which are provided in the totals here, and cumulative percentages, which are provided in the totals across the bottom as well. And, and if you sorted this the other way, you would come up with a completely different um, view of this data, and that's the advantage of a cross tabulation. You can work it six ways to Sunday to find out how it best represents the data that you're interested in. So that's it for this module, and um, you'll, as you can tell by the discussion through the module, we're going to come back to this a lot in assignment number five, but there's other uh, material which I need you to know before we actually assign assignment number five to you, but this is where the descriptive statistics come in as part of assignment number five.